Despite what critics might have said, despite how ripped to shreds the movie was, I loved After Earth. I, some of y'all laughing. I loved After Earth. Will Smith in his book talked about how it was one of his worst box office films, but that wasn't the thing that destroyed him most. The thing that destroyed him most was the fact that his son Jaden, who also starred with him in the movie, got ripped to shreds by the critics too. You'll notice Jaden hasn't done a single movie since, okay? Jaden did everything Will told him. He followed all the orders. He followed through on everything he was told to do. And the world ate his son alive. So much so the boy, again, He's put some terrible uh, rap albums out, but he's um, acting wise, never done it again. But I love the movie because for those of you that don't know, it's a science fiction film that tells the story of General Cypher Rage played by Will Smith. And he's this legendary military general, this science fiction that takes place a millennium after humans have left Earth because it's no longer inhabitable and everything on Earth has now evolved to pretty much destroy human life. And so uh, General Rage ha is legendary and iconic because he mastered the ability to ghost. Now, not ghost like not respond to text, but literally this monster that they're fighting is called the Ursa, and the Ursa detects human fear, and that's how it started wiping out humans. And so he mastered the ability to cloak his fear or not display fear in the presence of the Ursa so that they could destroy them. And so then his son, Jaden, uh, pl uh, plays this uh, kid named Kitai, and he wants to be just like his dad. But their relationship is strained. It's bad because General Rage is always gone. He's off fighting on other planets and in distant lands. And so his son, in an attempt to be like his dad, decides he's going to join the Ranger Corps. And so he, he can outrun everybody. He can outthink everybody. He's quick on his feet. He's strong. He looks the part. But when it comes down to cadet selection, the major says, out of all the cadets we've ever had, you're one of the best. You display great um, skill. You've got all the intangibles that are needed out in the field. Here's the problem. You don't have what it takes on the inside. You don't have it. In the field, I can't trust you. You're selfish. You're reckless. That'll get people killed in battle. And so, of course, Kitai is just destroyed because he can't follow in the steps of his father. He asked the major, please reconsider. And the major just says, dismissed, cadet. And he has to leave the room. Now, Kitai wants to be like his dad. He competes. He wants to be it. He has all the intangibles. He has everything he needs to be a ranger except what's on the inside. And my favorite scene that comes up in the movie is when they uh, General Rage decides to take Kitai on a mission to Earth to drop the Ursa off so that they can destroy it and get it away from their planet. The ship crashes. Everybody on board except General Rage and Kitai survive. The ship breaks in half. It's on one side of the planet, and the ship that Kitai and General Rage are on is on the other. So General Rage, played by Will Smith, his legs are broken. He's the trained ranger. He's the one with the intangibles and what's on the inside to go and get the communications beacon, but he can't do it. So he has to trust his son to go and retrieve this beacon. And one of my favorite moments happens when uh, he first steps off the ship. Now, the, the suit that he's wearing is equipped with an indicator to detect elevated heart rates, to detect danger, and the, the uh, suit can evolve to the environment. So the second that Kitai steps off the ship, all of those intangibles that he doesn't have on the inside pop up on the screen for his dad to see. His heart rate is elevated. He's about to have a panic attack. And he's like, Kitai, get down. Take a knee. Take a knee. Root yourself in this present moment. Now, sight, sound, smell, what do you feel? And Kitai says, my body's heavy. He said, good. Earth's gravitational pull is different from Nova Prime. So he gets up and continues on in the mission. And another part that I like that comes after this is once again, his heart rate is elevated, but he's surrounded by actual enemies. It's a bunch of baboons, basically. All right, so he tells him, Kitai, calm down. 
Step away slowly, step away slowly, and you'll be fine. But lacks the intangibles on the inside, he picks up a rock and throws it at a, at a baboon. Now, for those of you who've ever been to Africa or seen Animal Planet for at least one episode, you know, if you back away slowly, you pose no threat. You pick up a rock and throw it at a baboon, well, remember this, baboons never travel alone. What he thought was one baboon turned out to be a whole army of baboons. So now he's got to run, and he's running, and he's running, and he's running, and he dives in the water, swims away, crosses a river, and keeps running until his dad comes on the communications beacon and says, Kitai, you are no longer in danger. Kitai, stop running. Cadet, take a knee. You are running from yourself. So he stops, takes a knee puts his hand on the ground, and he says, continue, he detects that he's top, that he's, uh, after swimming in the water, a leech has gotten a hold of him, and now his body is poisoned, and so he has to go through the process of administering the toxin, and there's a whole host of other things, but why am I talking about a science fiction movie when some of us have our minds on this Memorial Day brunch? Listen, here's the thing. Whatever is in our hearts, is going to be what shows up when the moment comes. Whatever's in our hearts is gonna show up when we gotta respond a certain way. I tell the students, it's like a bucket. You really don't know what's in it until you tip it over. What's gonna come out when your bucket is tipped over? Cussing, anger, anxiety, panic, rage, frustration. What's going to happen when that moment comes and we get, you get fearful and we get desperate? And again, we look the part. We got all the intangibles. We got the education. I've even I've, I've learned how to dress like a student pastor. I've learned, I've got the grays plucked out in my beard, all of that. I look the part. But on the inside, God, do I have it? I've shown up to work, God. We showed up to the marriage. We went to counseling. We did everything right. I've worked hard at this company. We worked hard for this organization. But God, what's still missing? You and I have to do exactly like what General Rage was telling his son. You got to conduct an examination. You got to assess where are you. We got to conduct an examination of our hearts. Now, we hear this, this statement about our hearts. We hear this statement about being after God's heart. And we're going to talk about what that actually means because you've heard it your whole life. But do you really know what it means to be after God's heart? Sure, the heart is definitely that organ in our chest that serves those certain physical functions, but it's a lot more than that. The Bible tells us that the mouth actually speaks what the heart is full of. So if you're wondering, why do I pop off like that? It's because it's here. Not here, here. If you're wondering why you're short-fused with folks, that's not here, that's here. That's on the inside. Um, it, the heart, biblically speaking and spiritually speaking, are where our emotional and intellectual and spiritual and moral foundations are. And if we don't conduct those heart assessments and we're not careful about what we let in there, like bitterness and malice and rage and all those things Paul warned us about, we can mess everything up. So for our time together today, I want us to do something. We're going to look at some Bible. And for those of you who pull out your apps, I want to do something different today. I'm going to ask you to keep it out. And the reason why is because we got two, not long verses, but if you're not used to hearing, you know, 13 to 14 verses on Sunday morning, you might be like, man, that's a lot. So we got two verses that we're going to be looking at. And when PC gave me this assignment, I struggled for a while because I'm like, man, out of the two characters we're going to be looking at, Saul and David, it's like, man, there's so many victories that we could have looked at to assess the heart. Oh, but the more I studied it. The more I talked to PC, the more I studied it, the more I was like, do I really have to do this one? And he was like, yes, do well, man of God, and walks out, right? <laughs> the more I read it, the more I came to understand you can really learn a lot from a person by what happens with how they handle correction and how they handle mistakes. So we're going to look at two, not victories, but mistakes made by Saul and David. For the message, I'm titling this message, Check Yourself. Everybody say, check yourself. Not the ice cube version, but definitely check yourself. 
The first verse, the first passage we're going to look at is 1 Samuel, the 13th chapter, and we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 15. 1 Samuel, the 13th chapter, and we're going to be lifting up verses 1 through 15. And I'm going to be reading from the NIV. Now watch this. Saul was 30 years old when he became king and reigned over Israel 42 years. Saul chose 3,000 men from Israel. 2,000 were with him at Michmash and in the hill country of Bethel. And 1,000 were with Jonathan, his son, at Gibeah and Benjamin. The rest of the men he sent back to their homes. Jonathan attacked the Philistine outpost at Gibba, and the Philistines heard about it. Then Saul had the trumpet blown throughout the land and said, let the Hebrews hear. So all Israel heard the news. Saul has attacked the Philistine outpost, and now Israel has become obnoxious to the Philistines. We bragging. And the people were summoned to join Saul at Gilgal. Verse 5, the Philistines assembled to fight Israel with 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers, and soldiers as numerous as the sand on the seashore. They went up and camped at Michmash east of beth Aven. And when the Israelites saw that their situation was critical and that their army was hard-pressed, they hid in caves and thickets. Now they're hiding among the rocks and in the pits and cisterns. Some Hebrews even crossed the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Y'all know who hiding over there at Gad and Gilead, right? Okay. Saul remained at Gilgal and all the troops with him were quaking with fear. What's on the inside? He waited seven days, the time set by Samuel the prophet, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal and Saul's men began to scatter. So he said, bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offering. This is a king now, not the priest. Just as he finished making the offering, the preacher showed up. Samuel arrived and Saul went out to greet him. What have you done? Asked Samuel. Saul replied, when I saw that the men were scattering and that you didn't come at the set time and the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal and I haven't sought the Lord's favor. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. It's not your job, right? You have done a foolish thing, Samuel said. You have not kept the command the Lord God gave you. God told him to wait seven days till Samuel got there. Don't do nothing till Samuel got there. He didn't do it. But now it says, you, you, you did not keep the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after, everybody say after, after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. So then Samuel left Gilgal and went up to Gibeah and Benjamin and Saul counted the men who were with him. He went from 3,000 to 600. All right. Let's go over to 2 Samuel real quick. Let's go over to 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 1 through 14. Y'all know what's about to happen. This is after David had his um, situationship, his entanglement, whatever we want to call it, with Bathsheba. All right. This is after it's all gone down. Um, he's already had Uriah the Hittite killed. Now Bathsheba's pregnant. So the preacher once again shows up. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, there were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who came to him. Oh, David burned with anger. He's mad. And said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, that's a swear, that's an oath, so now you're bound to whatever follows. As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. The preacher man said to David, you the man. You're that man. And this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you from the hands of Saul. 
I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all of Israel and Judah. That's a whole, that was a, that's a united nation. And if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. And this is what the Lord says out of your own household. I'm going to bring calamity on you before your very eyes. I will take your wives and give them to one who is close to you and he will sleep with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. Reality TV can't make this up. <laughs> then David said to Nathan, I sinned against the Lord. He didn't make excuses. I sinned against the Lord. And Nathan replied immediately, the Lord has taken away your sin. You're not going to die. He should have died. But he says, you're not going to die. But because by doing this, you have shown utter contempt for the Lord, the son born to you will. And he did a couple of verses later. So what are we doing? What do we do with this? These two texts, two kings, two men of God, two men who made decisions. But we got two different responses. And it's in those responses where we're going to learn how we're supposed to check ourselves. Here's the first thing. The first thing we have to do is we got to properly assess the situation. Take a knee. Look at your surroundings, sight, sound, smell. What do you feel? Because in both texts, both kings, they did assess the situation. Saul looked around and saw all of the chaos, betrayal, confusion, but he took it personal. He looked at this and said, oh, they leaving your boy. Oh, hold up. Y'all, they, they, they leaving me. They, they're supposed to be my army. We're supposed to fight together. They're leaving. Samuel not here yet. What do I, hold up, this, they leaving me. So he took it upon himself to do something. David assessed the situation and thought about how he could get away with it. He thought about how he could get away with it. Both kings failed to properly assess the situation. Here's the, here's the real thing. All of us conduct assessments every single day. We wake up, it's like, okay, feet on the floor. We, we, we making a mental assessment of, okay, what we capable of pulling off for that day and that time. All of us do it. But then when life happens, sometimes because of fear, because of what's on the inside, we get real desperate. We get real hasty, and then we start making decisions that we wouldn't necessarily make. We've got to assess the situations properly, because here's the thing. In the text, Samuel had already told Saul what to do. I'm going to be there in seven days. In seven days, here's how God's going to deliver you. It was that simple. He had already been victorious before by doing what God had said to do. Now, again, we talked about what's on the inside. We talked about what's in there. And Saul had always had a spirit of fear about him. He was always a little reckless, kind of like Kitai in the movie. He was a little reckless at times. David, Saul was, Saul was um, supposed to just wait. David was supposed to actually be at war. What did the text open up and say? During a time when kings were supposed to be at war. Now, here's the thing. If you're supposed to be at war, where should you be? At war. Y'all with me? You trekking with me? But David's at home. The Bible says he gets up out of his bed in the evening. So that means he's been chilling all day. It ain't like he got streaming services. Dude's been in the bed all day. You're the king. You're behind a fortified wall, but all your men are at war. I started thinking about this, V. Why get up at the evening? What do you know that we don't know? What have we been overlooking in that text? This morning it dawned on me. Bathsheba is the daughter of Eliam. Eliam is David's best fighter. So he would know exactly where his best fighter is living because in a time of war, if somebody breaches the walls, you got your best fighter close to you so that he can throw hands just, just before the enemy gets to you. So he would know exactly where to look and when to look. The Bible gives us all of those clues. David knew exactly what he was doing. He timed it perfectly. Let me just get up out the bed and... 
stretch my legs, and Lord have mercy. Looks out there, and oh no, I see Bathsheba. Now she way over there at the house, and he could have just been like, oh, okay, all right, bet, and go on about his business. But instead, have her come to me. Bring her here. Have her come here. They did the thing. He sent her on her way. Then he was like, ooh, mm. She sent a message back, I'm pregnant. He was like, oh, hey, go get, go, go get her husband. Go get Uriah. Brings Uriah back. Uriah uh, doesn't even go home. Uriah sleep at the gate. He's like, my boy is out there at war. We supposed to be at war. Warriors are supposed to be fighting the war. I'm not going home. He tried again to get him drunk and send him home. And even in a drunken state, Uriah had more sense than the king. He did the right thing. When we are desperate, when we lack in moments what's the right thing on the inside, we do reckless and foolish things. And not only that, we run the risk of overreacting. We run the risk of rushing into decisions. Look at this. With, with Saul, the reason Saul was even king was because the people got jealous. They were looking at all the other societies and going, hey, they got a king over here. They got a king in Gilead. They got a king in Gad. There's a king in Gilgal. There's a king all over these places. We got judges. Lord, give us a king. And God was like, oh, y'all want to, like, I, didn't I, didn't we just cross the Jordan? Didn't Joshua make you swear on oath that before we cross, you got to follow me all the days of your life? Because if you don't, your children and your children's children and the children's children are going to have, didn't we already do that? Then we cross into the promised land. He give you the land of milk and honey and every enemy you defeated. And yet here we are. Y'all are asking me for a king. I gave you manna from heaven. I gave you quail. We crossed the Red Sea successfully. We crossed the Jordan. We did all of these things. And yet you ask for a king. So God gave him the people's champ. He gave him Saul. And what we read about Saul is that he looked good. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says, hey, you know, for this current generation, he was the rock before there was the rock, right? For the older generation, it was Ken Norton and Mandingo, right? All right? Y'all trekking with me. You trekking with me. Okay. That was the, that was your, that's your king, all right? That's the king they got. This is who they asked for. This is what they wanted. And because they begged God, God gave them over to somebody who really on the inside didn't have it, but God blessed them anyway. Sometimes when we fail to properly assess, we stress out. And not only that, we become reckless in our responses. In the movie, there's a, in, in After Earth, there's a scene where all of a sudden, um, Jaden Smith is out there and he's mad. He's, he's angry. And he starts just breaking stuff and smashing things because he doesn't have enough of his air supply to continue the mission. And he's lied to his dad and his, and his he can hear the, the Will Smith can hear him, but Jaden can't hear Will. So he's watching them fuss and complain. And, he, and Will is just over there like, man, just just take a knee, please just take a knee. And finally he does and he gets up and completes the mission. How many times in life have we failed to prep properly assess the situations? How many times in your life this past week? This past month, throughout your life, have you looked at something and your assessment brought back something that really wasn't true? When Joshua and Caleb and the spies went and spied out the land in the Old Testament before crossing the Jordan, they assessed the situation and they saw, oh, my God, the people are giants. We will look like mere bugs to them. And Joshua and Caleb were like, man, look at this fruit. We can take this. Because they, they realize that in their assessment of the situation, the God they serve is bigger than the men in the land. Sometimes when we look at what's right in front of us, sometimes it's like, man, this is too big. And God is standing there like, you getting it? Come on. Man, I can't handle this on my own. Spirit is standing there like, good, you're getting it, you're seeing it. And then we're going to make one of two decisions. I'm going to either give this over to God or I'm going to try to handle this myself. Saul said, bring me the sacrifice. You're not authorized to do that. But he chose to do it. Saul said, let me offer, let me confer. But you and I need to properly assess the situation. So how do we do that? How do we properly assess? Here's the first thing. The way you properly assess a situation is, number one, you bring all your cares and concerns to God. God could have handled anything Saul and David brought to him in that moment. The Bible says it right there. God said, if this wasn't enough for you, I would have given you more. 
So if David would have looked at Bathsheba and been like, God, ooh, God would have been like, bet, let's get you another one. Saul, if he'd have just waited, I mean, Samuel is about to die. He's an old man on foot. There's no Uber, okay? There's no cars at this time. He's on foot, walking. He had already said it's going to take me seven days. If an old man tell you he's going to get somewhere in seven days, tack on a little bit, show a little grace. But Saul got reckless. Why? Because he looked around and all his boys were abandoning him. Some people crossed over to Gad where Goliath was. Some people crossed back over to Jordan. They like bump this. I'm going back into the land where God already delivered me from. You don't need them people fighting next to you anyway. Because them 600 that left would have been enough. But no, he got reckless. Bring every care and concern to God, but also be real about what you see. Be real about it. We're in a series of going organic. God can handle our organic feelings. We don't have to substitute or flavor it for God because there's nothing that scares him. There's nothing that makes God flinch and vacate the throne because, oh, snap, they getting it in at earth. I can't handle that. That's, that's not the God we serve. The God we serve looks at our situations and goes, OK, we doing this. I'm not going to do it when you want to, because Saul was about to learn a very important lesson. He says, if you'd have waited, your kingdom would have endured for all time. But now because you got reckless, you've disqualified your whole family from receiving a blessing. Jonathan should have been king next. Now Jonathan can't even do that. Jonathan's sons should have been kings. But now Jonathan's sons are now disqualified. God had to go and choose a whole nother line to bring Jesus through. OK. So we got to be real about what we see. And here's the last thing. You got to compare it to God. When you look at the situation, regardless of how big it may make you feel, when you put God up there on the measuring table, God should outweigh it. God should outmeasure it. God should be stronger than anything we're dealing with. Can, can I get a witness on that? God should be bigger than anything you and I are dealing with. Any situation, it doesn't matter what it is. This text is telling us if we just bring it, if we just properly assess it and say, God, here's what it is. God, I messed up. God, I paid too much. God, I spent too much on that car. God, I spent too much. Just be real about it. And I promise you, everything would have been okay. Here's the second point. If we're going to check ourselves, not only do we need to pro properly assess the situation, we also need to accept responsibility. Everybody say accept responsibility. See, I knew I was going to get some hesitation on that one because we struggle with this. Think about it. Who really, really, really want to own up to, you know, let's 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 keep it personal to, you know, having a warranty on the car that would have paid for the repair. But instead, getting a little reckless and heart accelerating in the dealership, um, paint, went, went ahead and spent money you really didn't have to spend. I'm, I'm not looking over there because this was me. I did this okay? two weeks ago. This was my mistake. All right. I I'm keeping it. I'm keeping it organic. We organic in here. Right. Y'all judge. Mm -mm, I'm Y'all need to repent. But that's what happens. We get somewhere and we think, OK, I got a decision to make. If I'd have waited five minutes, my wife was checking the warranty at the house and she called the company and was like, oh, yeah, I got to bring it in. We'll take care of that. All they would have paid was a fifty dollar deductible. Instead, we paid <laughs> too much. All right. I ain't going to give you all the cost. But who wants to accept responsibility for that? So I get home and Melissa's like, help me understand. <laughs> and so I'm like, so you should have went and took the car instead of me. You know, you knew I had to get up. You know, I got to get ready to preach to the kids in the morning. I ain't got time. That's it. And she was just like, my God, okay. So that's what we do. It's one thing to be wrong and you don't know you're wrong, but it's another thing to be just like complete, just dead wrong and start making excuses about it. In the movie, Kita started blaming Will Smith for uh, uh, General Rage for not being there. You were always fighting. You were always at war. That's why the Ursa broke in our house. That's why it killed my sister. That's why mom don't like you. That's why all of this stuff. And he's just like, mm-hmm. Mm hmm. That still don't change the fact that you're panicking, you're scared and fear is taking over. So instead of waiting and taking a knee, the boy runs and jumps off a cliff because he's got a wing suit and he's realized the shortest distance between two points was to jump. 
But Will had asked him, uh, General Rage said, hey, just come back to the ship. The moment's too big for you. I failed you. I shouldn't have asked you to do this. And he starts pumping his chest up. I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. And the boy just runs and jumps. And for a few minutes, he's sailing on smooth air, y'all. He's getting it. And it's like, okay. And then this giant pterodactyl eagle looking thing swoops in and snatches him up. Isn't that like sin? For a minute, it's good. For a minute, we sailing, we out there. It's like, man, I can't believe I can live like this. And then, boom, rock bottom. That's what happens to us. And then when we get caught in the sin, instead of going, I shouldn't have jumped. I shouldn't have responded to the text. I shouldn't have shown up there. It's, but I mean, like, why can't I have fun with my life? I'm an adult. I went to school. I did what mom and daddy said. I'm the good child. I'm not the black sheep. I listened all 40 and 50 years I was in church on the front row every Sunday. I deserve some me time. And God is standing there like, okay, all right, cool. In Genesis, we saw this. Adam standing right there by Eve eating the fruit. And it was like, yeah, but Eve, yeah, before we jump on Eve's case, before we do that, God didn't read the rules to Eve. <laughs> God was standing right there. Hey, Adam, check this out. You got all of this. Stay away from there, okay? But everything else but that. Adam knew that. So he see his wife talking to a snake. Now, if he named the animals, a talking snake should have been something that stood out to him. <laughs> but it didn't for some reason. Or just a moment of biblical exegetical freedom here for a second. Um, I think he was standing there waiting to see what was going to happen to her. Just standing there holding something God told her not to hold instead of going, hey, 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 hey I'm in charge of the, the, telling the snake. Uh-uh, you, took, you twisted God's words. Instead, he over there. I mean, okay, cool. She eats the fruit, and the punishment don't come until he eat it. But instead of owning it, God shows up. You walk with God every day. And then one day you show up late to your appointment with God. You've been walking with God every day. And in this one day, you decide, hey, I'm going to hide. And he's like, hey, Adam, where are you? God knows exactly where we are. But like a good parent, I want to hear it from you. Hey, I'm naked. Who told you that? Ooh. Instead of going, man, God, I, we ate the fruit. Man, that woman you gave me, she, she ate it. And then I ate it. And then all of a sudden, and God is like, so here's how this is going to happen. Both of y'all kicked out the garden. And then that's, but this is what we do. We make excuses. We don't accept responsibility. King Saul in the text was like, bro, you was late. 800 something year old man running late. Go figure. <laughs> right. But you're like, man, you ran late. So I started offering the sacrifice and I, but I realized I ain't talked to God. And, you know, I got to talk to God before we go to war, because how dare I, the king, go to war without conferring with God. And then Samuel's like, that was foolish. Now you've lost the kingdom. Y'all with me still? But in the other text, it's in David's response where we really get something. Nathan rebukes David. David was like, cool. Yeah, that man need to die. And then Nathan was like, hey, you the man. And here's everything that's going to happen. David didn't make any excuses. David said, I sinned against God. And in his mind, he knows he's supposed to die. Nathan says, your sins are forgiven. You're not going to die. But sin has consequences. It always does. It always exacts a toll, as Thanos said on Avengers. Y'all know I had to throw one of those in there. Sin is always going to exact a toll that we don't always expect. And in this instance, she was pregnant with a son which meant that's another heir to the throne. That's gone now. Not only that, God says, not only are you going to lose that, but you're going to lose your, your wives. You're about to lose this kingdom. And then later on, it's like, but a man from your line will never cease to be on the throne because that's how we get Jesus. But you're going to witness chaos in your time before you die. There's always consequences, y'all. It doesn't do us any good to avoid responsibility. Because it's not like we can hide from God. Because wasn't it David that said in Psalm 139 verse 7, where can I go from your spirit? 
Where can I flee from your presence? David knew not to run. David knew there was nowhere he could hide because this is also the same David that wrote the majority of Psalms that wrote about God's presence and about the heavens declaring his glory. And the same David that wrote about the victories. And this is also the same David that would write in journals, God, take my enemies out and God would do it. And in those same verses would come along and say it was good that I suffered because I wouldn't have witnessed your goodness. Sometimes we have to be so organic. We got to be honest about these mistakes. God, I did it. Confession is real good. Like my son, I, I, I'll tell that this morning, perfect example. My son likes to play, he likes to be the lotion monster in our house. Y'all have probably seen this Facebook photo if you follow my wife, but my son likes to put all the lotion on his face. He can. All on his arms as much as he can, but he won't lotion his knees. But Loves it all over his face and likes to jump out of corners like, ah, and I'm like, what a waste of resources. But between him and his mother, it's this cute exchange that they do every morning to get ready for school. This morning, I flipped out. I'm like, dude, like, we got to go. Why are you wasting resources? And the disappointment on his face when I did that was so bad. Like, I, I'll, I'll never forget. I had to sit there and like get back, like, get back in alignment with him because I could tell I, I disrupted something there. And if we're not real, we'll continue to do that with God. We'll be sitting up there and God is God is OK with us making mistakes, but we got to own it. Because if I asked him, what was he doing? He would have said nothing, but got all this lotion on his face. We can't we, we can't do that with God. So what does accepting responsibility look like? It looks like one, you got to acknowledge what you did. And I'm not saying don't don't, don't go don't go trying to own stuff you didn't do. Don't do that because that's just silly. Don't do that. Acknowledge the offense. What did you actually do? Because what that shows is where your heart actually is. Because if you can accept responsibility for what you actually did, you're right there. You're on your way. That's what repentance looks like. It's turning away from the thing. It's the changing of the behavior, right? But you got to accept the responsibility. But also you can't make excuses. Don't do it. Don't make excuses. You did it. Now, if, there, you want, if, you want to, if you're asked for clarity around it, give it, but don't make excuses. Don't get all defensive. You did the thing. You got caught in the thing. Own it, right? Listen to the people who were offended. You got to listen to them because the worst thing you can do is be quick to shut somebody down over something you did. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. I know I did, I did, but I'm sorry. All right, cool. We good now? I apologize. That's not how it works. What if David had a told Nathan, yeah, 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 man, I messed up, I messed up. All right, I don't want to hear all the rest of that. It would have been worse, but he listened to every word. You got you to gotta, you gotta, you gotta listen to who you offended. Then you got to accept the consequences. Consequences happen. Every decision, for every action, there's an equal and opposite, whatever that law is or that theorem, there's a, there's a reaction, right? There's consequences. Frankie Beverly said what goes up is going to come down. Here's the last thing. You got to work to change the behavior. That's repentance. Working to change the behavior is one of the most important things we can do. Because if, working, if we're working on it, that means we're going to make some progress. We might mess up. We might slip up. But that's what grace covers us from. But we got to be making progress towards the goal, right? But you got to work on it. If you're not willing to do the work, True, true, true apology, you're not really giving a genuine apology. It's just, I don't want to deal with the consequences. So let me just take the, let me accept responsibility so I don't have to deal with what might come. It happens. Here's the last point. Not only to check ourselves do we need to properly assess the situation and accept responsibility, the last thing we got to do is we got to obey God. It all comes back to obeying God. In every situation, in every situation, in both texts, Nothing bad would have happened had they just done what God said do. David should have been at war. That's, it's, it's simple. This is what kings do during that time. Imagine being the king and you show up and Eliam is there, his best warrior, but the king ain't there. That's an insult. So pride might have had a little something to do with why David wasn't there, but there's a little something else going on there too. But also, if Saul had just waited a few more minutes, because the Bible says as soon as he finished the sacrifice, Samuel shows up. If he'd have just waited, he wouldn't, David wouldn't have been there to see Bathsheba had he just been at war. Saul had awaited. Everything would have happened. 
give you a perfect example of why we should just obey. So a couple years ago, I got this idea to start working on this book. Um, my grandfather was dealing with dementia and there was a lot of stories that he would tell and I would start capturing them. And they had some good biblical lessons in there. And so I said, I told my COG at the time, I'm like, you know what, I think I'm gonna go ahead and write this. And everybody prayed about it with me. I, I got somewhat started. I, I created a folder in my OneDrive and that was it. And they just kept egging me like, man, I need to finish this book. I need to write this, I need to write this, I need to write this. So then one day, two years later, I'm sitting on Facebook scrolling and a book with the same theme, Lessons from My Grandfather, is being published by Chris Paul, the basketball player, the one all of y'all in here hate, yes, that Chris Paul. So not only is he making Mavericks fans and everybody else upset, Chris Paul made me very upset because now he published the very thing I was supposed to have been doing. What is that telling you? God never said, write a Pulitzer Prize winning novel, Dr. Jones. See, I had the intangibles. I looked the part. I got the education. I know what to do. I got the tools. I got the resources. I just didn't do the work. That's what's on the inside. I was lazy. Made too many excuses. Every time I could have been, ah, man, I'm going to go do something else. Oh, I got kids. Let me go now try to pull them into my chaos, right? We have got to obey what God says to us because God wants obedience. Because here's what obedience tells you. PC says this all the time. Obedience is a clear indication of our maturity. It's a clear indication of where our hearts are because if we're not going to be obedient, there's some things that come with that. But here's what obedience shows. What do you treasure? Jesus said where a man's treasure is, his heart's there. What are the things that come out of your mouth? Luke 6, 45 says, the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Where are you spending your time mostly? Because if you're directing all your energy and all your efforts at things that aren't pointing others towards Jesus, but pointing them towards our own individual accolades, that might be where our heart is. Where are we constantly focusing our attention? Is it on the problem? Is it on the fear? Or is it on the faith? I want to challenge you to point your focus towards Jesus, because whatever God has called us to do, we just need to do it. And so I close with this thought. You know, we've talked about this movie and we've talked about just taking that moment to assess the situation and checking ourselves. But I'm reminded that and I'd be a bad preacher if I didn't say it like this. Jesus had to check himself once in Gethsemane. Jesus had to check himself. Because when you look at that Gethsemane situation, I think a lot of the times we just jump immediately to the he prayed three times and then got arrested. But there's some meat in there in that text that I don't want us to miss, because right there in the garden, he's praying three times because the moment's big. The moment is is causing the, the, the God's Jesus's internal mechanisms to go crazy. He's panicked. He's anxious. He's so anxious, he's sweating drops of blood. Not only that, he's begging the disciples to pray for him. That's the first time we see that. He's asking people to pray for him, humans, that he knew how they got created, knew their stories, asking them. But here's the most amazing thing about that very organic moment, because a lot of us look at the cross and it's like, yes, and we should never gloss over the cross. But it's the decision to go there in the first place. That's where the rubber meets the road. That's the truest act of obedience, because in a moment of self-reflection, we see Jesus at his most organic moment. He didn't just kneel. Jesus got down there and he said, he's got both hands on the floor. He's got both knees on the ground. His face is on the ground. And not only is he crying out, and begging, he's like, God, take this from me. Don't make me do this. They're sinners. This is too much. It's too painful. It's too excruciating. Please, if it's possible, if it's possible, Father, please, please, God, don't make me do this. 
How many of you have been on your knees lately? How many of you have gone before the Father? How many of you fell to your knees after getting that news from Uvalde the other day? How many of us went to our knees when that family member we should have been praying for gave us a call? How many times have we asked God, please deliver me from this thing? And we don't get the answer. But here's what I love about it. What I love about Jesus, what I love about our Savior is that he could have easily stayed there. He could have easily stayed on his feet, on his knees, and kept begging and begging and begging. But instead, he said, yet, nevertheless, not as my will, but as you will. And you know how the story ends. You know how the story ends. The story ends with him getting up and allowing himself to be arrested for you and for me. He took a self-assessment. He was afraid. Not only was he afraid, he was panicked, sweating blood, crying, upset. And not only that, he took responsibility. Yet, not as I will, but as your will. He looked around. Behold, the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of sinners. Let's go. And he went. You don't get there without being organic. You can't get to that crucible, that crossroad, and that moment where God is trying to take you somewhere powerful in your life, to take you to that moment where you're really about to experience something great. You can't get there until you have that moment, until you have that moment where you've knelt down and you said, God, I don't want this. Keep it real. God, I don't want to do this. But then when he got up, he kept going, and he died for us, and he died for you and me. If you're here today, if you're here today, I'll close with this. If you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus, make him your leader today. If you've never accepted him as Lord and Savior, make that decision today. If you've taken that assessment, if you've really been checking yourself during this service, make him your leader today. If you really want to accept responsibility, you can actually, Jesus already took the responsibility. We know we're guilty. Confess that guilt. And here's the good news. When you confess it, he's already paid the price for it. Now all you got to do is obey and accept. That's it. You conduct the check. Jesus has already paid the price. All you got to do is accept him. Stand with me all over the building. And Pastor V is going to come and extend this invitation. But I want to encourage each and every one of you today to make that decision to let God be your leader and to let God be your deliverer. God bless you. Come on, church, help me praise God for the preaching gift. That was time spent with the Lord. Come on, we can do a little bit better than that. We can do a little bit better than that. It's clear that the Lord has spoken. What a relevant word. What a real word. What a word that requires a level of reflection. I think as he was talking, I know for myself personally, and I would imagine for many of you in this room, even now, there was a moment that perhaps has happened relatively recent where you know you probably could have accepted a level of responsibility. Before we leave, before we open the doors of the church, as I was sitting there, I just heard God say, this word is too rich to just let it pass by. I'm going to invite you to do something that many of us don't do as often as we should. I want you to take a moment. I want you to reflect not on what you've done right. I want you to take a moment. I want you to reflect on what you've done wrong. 
The reason why I want to invite you to do that is because that might be the thing that's separating you between where you are currently and what you desire to experience with God in the days ahead. And so in your own way, we're going to pray that God would give us an opportunity. In fact, that's what he's doing now. He's giving us an opportunity to check ourselves. Take my heart and mold it. Take my mind, transform it. Take my will, conform it to yours. To With every head bowed, every eye closed, I want you to take a moment and do an assessment of your own heart. And mold it. Take my mind. Oh. Transform it. Take my will. That's our prayer today, Lord. Conform it. To yours, to yours, oh Lord. Holiness, holiness is what I long for. Holiness is what I can sing it. So, Father, in this moment, we acknowledge that as much as we have attempted to do what you have asked us to do, we have fallen short. Some of us, we've done it willfully and willingly, and then there are others of us who we didn't realize what we were doing when we were doing what we were doing, but... We acknowledge in some way, shape, form, or fashion, we've said something, we've thought something, we've done something that has dishonored you. And we acknowledge it because we already know you know, but we're acknowledging it to say to you that we know that you know. And I pray very simply is this, that you would forgive us. Would you Create within us a clean heart and renew within us a right spirit. Would you take not your presence from us, take not your spirit from us, so that we can continue to do and to be who you have called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. In this spirit of worship, what I appreciate about this sermon is that though it was relevant for all of us, it really was a guide for what it means to say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ. If you've never made Christ your leader, all you've got to do, the Bible is very clear, is you've got to accept responsibility, confess with your mouth. Believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, and the Bible is very clear. If you do that, then you are saved. Perhaps you need some help making that decision. Perhaps you need some greater clarity with respect to what all that looks like. If you are in this room, I want to invite you to meet some of the most amazing spiritual decision counselors 
in room 145. It's to my left and your right. You see that purity lady over there with that nice, pretty hair? Got a hand raised. That's Alicia Garrett. She's gone. She's gone. Her and members of that team will, will talk to you more about the decision that you've made. Or if you want to make that decision and you are online, you too can make that decision. We've got care counselors. We've got spiritual decision team members there who help you to make that decision. All you've got to do is dial that number 877-632-0702. I want to invite you to make that decision today because it is, without any equivocation, the greatest decision you could ever make in your life. I've got people in here who can testify that there's nothing better than knowing Jesus, yes? Well, aren't you glad you came to church today? Come on, help me praise God for Notori, for leading us in worship. Help me praise God for... Our minister to students, Dr. Brandon W. Jones. Come on, keep those hands clapping. Clap for the people near you. Yeah. Before we.